I think there's always going to be a certain type of guest that fits your property. Just be authentic and be true to yourself and to the listing because there are going to be people who appreciate it and love it for what it is. All right, guys, welcome to another episode of The Report. Today, I got someone who has been with me since day one, building this stuff uh, with me. She's been my right-hand girl. She is a real estate investor herself. She has her own short-term rental that she manages, and she's also responsible for managing all the boutique hotels and short-term rentals in her portfolio. I got none other than Jennifer Booby. Jennifer, welcome to the show. Rich, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, thanks for coming on the show. It's, uh, I wanna go back a little bit, and uh, you know, we met, we were actually, I think you had just moved out here with your fiance, Mark. Mm -hmm. Love Mark, great dude. Um, and we were neighbors at the Ariel here in Little Italy. And uh, we, uh, we started talking real estate. And I believe at the time, Mark was interested in purchasing a condo to live in as a primary residence. And I remember we went out for some drinks and we talked about it and we're like, hey, I was like, hey, did you guys ever consider maybe getting a investment property instead, maybe a short term rental? and then using that cash flow to supplement your rent wherever you guys decide to live. And so uh, I remember actually helping you guys buy your uh, first investment property here in San Diego in an area called National City. Um, talk about that, how's that going? Yeah, so I appreciate you sharing the story. It's definitely a little bit nostalgic for me to think about that being kind of our first introduction into real estate. And like you mentioned at the time, like uh, Mark, who's amazing, um, Mark and I, we fell in love with San Diego. And at the time we were thinking, this is the place that we wanna make our home. And so we started looking at properties that we were gonna live in um, just because we knew that we wanted to be here for a long time and we were excited about the community. And so when you, first brought up the idea of a short-term rental or an investment property, I honestly was the one that thought that you were absolutely crazy. I was like, yeah, I know, like, <laughs> Rich is our neighbor. He's a really nice guy, like, really enjoyed uh, talking with him. But this is a wild idea. I, I don't even know if it's ever going to happen. I've never heard of anything like this before. Um, so Mark and I talked about it a little bit. And um, I've always been the optimistic one all throughout my life. And so it was a little bit weird for me to be stepping more on, I guess, my parents' side of thinking of, you know, pulling back a little bit and wanting to be a little bit more cautious with my cash. Um, and so Mark was actually the one that coached me into saying, hey, I think it's actually going to work. I think we should give it a shot. So we started looking at properties um, and that was fun for us, just driving around to all the different communities that we thought would be cool um, to actually have an investment property in. And we looked at some a wide range of places and you walked on um, many of the properties with us as well, which was amazing. Um, but yeah, we, we uh, walked on a wide variety of different properties until we finally found this one in National City. Yeah, and, and National City was a strategic play because mm -hmm. at the time there was pending short-term rental regulations coming down the pipeline in the city of San Diego, basically meaning they were gonna limit the supply of short-term rentals. At the time there was about 16,000 and some change and they were gonna limit it to about 5,500. Mm -hmm. And so we thought, okay, well, how can we hedge that risk? What if we go into an area like National City, which is not regulating? And so as the regulations come down the pipeline in the city of San Diego, it's going to bring more demand to those who can legally operate and those who have short-term rentals in National City. And I love that property. I remember when we first looked at it, it was a, it's a duplex. Um, it's got a single family, two, one, two bedroom, one bath in the front, and it's got a studio unit on the back, but it's on a really large lot. And um, it was just recently renovated. And what was the purchase price? Do you remember? Oh, gosh. I think it was around 630 is what we purchased it for. Yeah. And honestly, like looking at that property, we, when we first rolled up, and, and I see by the smile on your face that you remember how it looked too. I mean, yeah. it was it was weeds. It was gravel. Um, there was this really ugly chain link fence that had this weird green plastic kind of woven in and out of it from our neighbors next door. It was just, it was a very strange and off-putting on the outside. But like you mentioned, I mean, the interior was completely renovated. It was beautiful, like all nice appliances, places that I could imagine even coming in and, and baking in that, that kind of a kitchen or spending time in. Um, so really it was it, it was a very interesting property and also a really big win on the purchase uh, in National City for a couple of reasons. One being what you mentioned with the new laws here in San Diego for short-term rentals, but also, I mean, National City and our zip code has just grown exponentially as a society since we made that purchase. Um, it's amazing just to see some of the developments and things that have happening that have been happening. Um, there's a new market 
kind of similar to our Liberty Station market that we have that's literally a couple of blocks away from our property. Um, guests have raved about loving to be able to walk from our property to this amazing market. Um, I go from uh, downtown San Diego here sometimes just to go have lunch or have a drink or spend some time in that. It's the market on 8th. Um, just because mm-hmm. it's still a fun place to be. So it's really cool to see some of those new developments in the area as well. Absolutely. And for the listeners out there that are not familiar with National City, you got downtown San Diego. And then if you go south, it's basically the next city south. It's mm-hmm. um, just about six miles from uh, the airport and six miles from downtown San Diego. And it's close to the water. And so if we're talking the progression um, of where these neighborhoods are going to drench or fry and where the money's going to go, National City was next on that list in terms of just progression and where the gentrification is going to go. So I love that you guys bought it then, and I love when you guys bought it. Um, but also the cool thing about that property is it was on a big lot, and the next-door neighbors is like a uh, one of the neighbors next door to the back of you guys is a um, like an industrial mm-hmm. building, right, which is great for – this type of operation because as you have short terminal guests coming in and out, you know that's one less neighbor that you guys have to worry about. And then in the back, you have an alley. And then um, across the street, you don't really have a lot going on. You just have one really neighbor to be concerned about, um, which is kind of cool, right? Because sometimes you go by these short term rentals and you got 18 neighbors on every single uh, side of you. That's a lot of different personalities to manage. Yeah, it's also, it puts us in a really sweet spot for our guests. And we mm-hmm. always go through a very similar vetting process like we do with our management here at Excelsior Stays, always making sure that we're hosting five-star guests, that they're um, you know checking all of our boxes before we accept their reservation. But it really puts our guests in a sweet spot because they know that they can enjoy the backyard at night that they don't have to worry about like upsetting the nosy neighbor next door or um you know waking up a a baby that's sleeping in in the next house over or what have you they can really make the most of that outdoor space and so we've really been able to capitalize on marketing it like that um we did have one of course everyone always talks about with short-term rentals they always think that oh you know my neighbors are going to be complaining about the guests well for us the one complaint that we ever had was actually flipped one of the guests had called us one evening and she was this amazing grandmother. She had brought a bunch of her grandchildren and a couple of her kids along with her just for a weekend away in San Diego. And she calls us, it was like 1130 at night and I get a phone call and she's like, are we next to a nightclub? <laughs> and I'm, I'm looking at Mark because we were sitting on the couch like watching TV or something. And, and I'm looking at him and I'm like, I can't even think of anywhere that would be making noise around us this late at night. And so, um, you know, I'm asking her a couple more questions and we're kind of talking through what she's experiencing. And so finally I, I plug into our cameras and they don't really pick up a ton of noise. And so when I turned on the camera and I could hear loud, loud music, I knew that it, it had to be an issue. There was something going on. Mm-hmm. Um, so I call up one of my neighbors and turns out there's a mariachi band that's playing at a house a couple no of doors way. down. It was uh, someone's 16th birthday party. And I guess it, it was a once in a lifetime experience. Like she had never experienced anything like that either. Um, it, is that what you call a quinceanera? Yes, exactly, okay. exactly. And so this family had brought in this huge mariachi band and they were having a great time, but this poor grandmother, and she was so sweet about the whole situation. and. You know, eventually the music subsided later in the evening. But I just thought that was funny, you know, of all these experiences, people usually complain about the guests. But it was the one time, of course, someone had a mariachi party. That's a great track (laughs) record because you guys closed on that, I want to say, almost three years ago now. Yeah, that's true. And so, I mean, think about all the guests that you guys have hosted in those three years. And it's not just the one listing. And so for the listeners out there, the cool thing you can do, and, and this is what Jennifer did, Um, and we have some other, I have a property like this in San Diego and we have another one that we manage for a client of ours in Indiana. But, uh, if you have a duplex, uh, two, two pro or two buildings on one property, you can have, uh, two short term, uh, listings, one listing for each building or unit. And then you can have a third listing for someone to rent both units at the same time, which is appealing for larger families and larger gatherings. And so to think all the different guests that you guys have hosted over the almost last three years, for that to be your only noise complaint, <laughs> that's pretty impressive. I know. I better knock on wood or something. Um, I know. But lots of really amazing and positive stories aside from that one. But I still always think back. And in the moment, it was stressful. But now it's just um, you know a wonderful story to think back on. You guys were very confident. I remember in the uh, escrow period, mm-hmm. uh, especially Mark, You know your fiance, Mark, he, he 
did what I did to get started. He yeah. cashed out his 401k um, and went all in on this thing. Um, were you guys, what was the conversation like during the escrow period? Because this is a brand new thing for you guys. Sure. You know, it's all hypothetical until you actually turn the lights on and launch these listings. Were you guys a little bit nervous at the time? Definitely. Mostly yeah. on my end. Um, Mark is a very, uh, he's a very confident guy, especially like when he he's, is. he's very thoughtful and intentional about things. And so once he's thought through something and, uh, you know, really examined all the different parameters and possibilities that could happen, like if he says yes to it, I get my confidence from that. Cause I know that he's thought it out very well. Um, so I was the nervous Nelly of the two of us. Um, but knowing that Mark was really confident about it and, He's like, this is an opportunity we're never really going to have again, um, especially with the purchase price and everything going on in the market at the time. I mean, it was just a beautiful, beautiful um, timing of the market for us. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you guys, I love what you guys did with the landscaping because this property had not been landscaped, um, but the interiors had been redone. And so you guys went in there and did a magnificent job with the landscaping. You guys built like a Instagrammable feature um, in the back with like a fire pit and like this really cool like wooden like paneling that goes up the wall. And I remember you guys had kind of like a housewarming party before you started yeah. operating it. And um, I was just blown away from what I had seen before you had closed and then what it looked like after you guys had did all that work. Yeah, I mean, just the night, uh, the before and afters is just complete night and day. We even put up some of the photos of what the outside looked like um, before we did all the renovations and some um, some pictures just showcasing what the progress and what happened during the renovation period. Um, and guests love to comment all the time just about the dif the stark difference between the two of them. But we collaborated with a Drab to Fab here in San Diego. Huge shout out to Kurt and Alec for all of their amazing and, and creative work that they did for us. Um, but yeah, a lot of that, they, especially with the planting and picking out, we have three different palm trees in the backyard, a couple of beautiful big birds of paradise. I actually just stopped by the property just the other day, and um, my heart and soul of that planting was a lovely little lemon tree, and it's finally started to blossom, and we've been getting some citrus from it, so that's really cool for me to see um, kind of that progression, but um yeah, it's really amazing, especially just to touch on the ability to have three listings on a single property. Mm -hmm. We did designate um, designate it so that the studio has its own outdoor space and the main house has its own outdoor space as mm. well. So we have two of those gas fire pits. Um, we dug and planted the gas line ourselves, which was a really fun experience for me. Um, and then we have like the separate outdoor soft seating, but it's really fun because lots of big families would love to come in or a couple of different couples and they love to be able to relax and have their own outdoor space at the end of the evening after a day together. And the other great thing about this property is because it's on a large lot, you guys have the room if you guys choose mm -hmm. to down the road to build another unit, making it a triplex. Um, you have the uh, ability to maybe bring in like a, uh, what are those campers called that people, the, the Winnebago's Airstream. Yeah. You could bring in an Airstream, right? Yeah. If you can figure out a way to get some, some plumbing going, you could bring in an Airstream and that's mm -hmm. another short term rental listing on your property. Exactly. So what I loved about that, that deal is you had so many different levers that you could pull in so many different avenues to bring in additional revenue if you needed to. And I love that you mentioned the option to add in a, a third unit or a third dwelling as well, because we even got so excited about the possibility of that. We already laid a separate gas line so that when we get to that point where we want to put in that third dwelling space, that it, there's already a space that's ready for that fire pit. So they can also have their own outdoor always, space. Always thinking two steps exactly. ahead. That's Jennifer. I love it. Uh, so I wanted to ask you, what was your biggest um, learning lesson? Just kind of, you know, as a, as a new investor, for any new investors sure. out there that are listening to this right now and they want to buy their first short-term rental, what do you think was like the biggest challenge or learning lesson, maybe takeaway um, that you learned uh, just bringing that, that first couple listings up? Hey guys, real quick, I hope that you're finding value in this show. If you could do me a huge favor and drop a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or whichever platform you're listening on, it would mean the world to me. Also, if you know of anyone that would potentially benefit from this podcast, feel free to share it with them so we can help more people build wealth through real estate investing. Now back to the show. That's a really great question, especially considering, you know, all the all the little things that you learn along the way. Um, and even the things that I've learned just being a part of the company here over the past year. I think for me, the biggest thing is you will always have time or you will always have the desire for more time. 
Right. So while we were going and touring all these different properties or even picking out the furnishings or, you know, making plans for what it was going to look like, like we always thought, OK, well, if we just take a little bit more time and, you know, maybe look at a couple different more properties or, you know, we're going to find that perfect coffee table, it's going to be out there. Mm. But the truth is that you just have to make a decision and you just have to take that first step and get started, because once that happens, just the idea of it being snowballing and it just creates that momentum and that energy just continues and continues. Um, but you do have to just make that decision and take that first step. I think, um, especially as we were getting towards the launch of the property itself mm -hmm. and, you know, we we're making everything guest ready and we were putting in those finishing touches. I think I was, um, that final week I was going around the house and I was like, oh, well, I want a couple extra throw pillows. Or what if we put in some more lighting over here? You know, all those little final details that you think about at the end of the project. Yep. Finally, Mark told me, he was like, okay, well, you can do those things, but we just have to get the listing up. And then after the listing is up, it'll probably be, you know, a couple of weeks or a month before we even get our first booking or our first guest. So you'll have plenty of time to do that stuff. That wasn't true whatsoever. <laughs> we listed the property on Sunday evening and we were up until like, I think, 2.30 in the morning, just answering booking requests. It was ridiculous. Wow. It got to a point where we just we both looked at each other and said, we just have to get some sleep. You know, we both have work the next morning. We're going to sleep and then we'll figure it out the next day. So uh, we met for lunch the next day and kind of made a game plan of what that was going to look like. But just the appetite for it was incredible. And to think if I had just spent an extra week trying to put in those little details and hadn't taken that first step, we wouldn't have had that experience. Yeah, I feel like it's easy to get into analysis paralysis. If you're new, you're, shed, you're setting up your first listing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's so many decisions to be made in regards to furnishing. Um, but even in the selection process of maybe acquiring your first mm -hmm. deal, uh, it's easy to go into analysis paralysis. I've been there before. Uh, my first deal was 11 units in Cincinnati. And, you know, I was in analysis paralysis. I was looking all over the country, different markets, and I didn't know what I wanted to buy. But I love that you said you just got to find something that's a fit and make a decision and go with it. And that's what allows us to make many more decisions and buy many more deals in this space. Um, I wanted to ask you about the guest communication because um, you know, I think one of the, one of the most like, compelling things about your personality and why you're so good at what you do is that you're great with people, you're great with uh, guests and, and making sure that they have the best experience possible. Um, what was that like? doing the guest communication early on, any transitions for you or learning lessons, or was it just like a natural fit, plug and play type of thing? I loved it. I was, yeah. honestly, I was addicted to it. I couldn't <laughs> get enough of it. Um, I definitely like Mark had to help me, you know, put my phone away and like make sure that I wasn't, um, you know, constantly on it because I wanted to be receptive to those guests. And, you know, I wanted to share recommendations and, you know, let them know that I'm just as excited to host them as they are to come and stay and experience San Diego. So for me, I was just, it, it felt so natural. I loved it. Um, and I still love to communicate with people and, uh, you know, share more about the house or, or the city with them. Sure. So fast forward a little bit. Um, I was launching Fortune Cribs. Um, which is now doing business as Excelsior Stays, which is kind of our hospitality brand. And, and it's our management arm that we use to manage all the uh, boutique hotels and short-term rental listings that we manage. Um, but when I was cr first growing it, um, I had my three short-term rental listings here in San Diego. And we had the first three client properties that we were gonna, about to bring on. And I thought, okay, we need someone good to come on to go launch these properties to manage these properties, do the guest communication and do a lot of that stuff. And I remembered I ran into you and Mark at one of our real estate meetups uh, here in San Diego called Beers and Deals Rooftop. Um, and you said, hey, if you ever need someone to help you grow, um, give me a call, I'm interested. And I remember that. And so um, when, I, when I needed to make that first hire, you were the first person I thought of. And I remember we went out and had coffee and we chatted about it and you were just on board from day one. You were like, hey, I will quit my job. I wanna do this and I wanna make it happen. And um, I hired you and honestly, like you've just crushed it. I mean, you've just been killing it ever since. And I'm just so grateful and lucky that, that we have you on the team and um, look at everything that we built just in a short amount of time. And so thank you for that. And thank you for the opportunity. I mean, it's been an incredible experience for me and just really exciting to see that 
now this amazing team and portfolio that we've grown into. We have Andrea and Belle and Marlin and now on the Summers Capital side, you know, working with Lauren and Alex. It's just it's amazing to think about how we started in that little tiny office and just to see not only our growth as people, but also as the company and our portfolio has grown as well. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to of be a course, part of Of course, of course. So what was your mindset when you first came on the team? And I think the first one was uh, a property in Scottsdale for one of our clients. Yeah. What was your mindset then? I was excited. I mean, I love a good challenge. And so for me coming in, there were a lot of parameters about the position and just about things that you described to me that was going to be a need and a requirement of the job that I thought, okay, you know, I I can draw from this part of my background or I have a, a bit of a background in hospitality. And so, you know, I can pull that to help with the guest side of things. And so there were a lot of things that seemed to fit in place. But then also with it being a startup, there were so many things that I was just really excited and energized by the idea of being challenged by and getting into strange situations, especially in the very beginning, like getting into situations that I was like, okay, I don't know how to do this or how we're going to do this, but I know that I can figure it out and uh, we figured it out together. So, yeah, you were very crucial, um, especially early on, because when you go launch these listings, there's a lot of work to do, to do right? So someone's got to fly out. You got to uh, make sure that everything is designed and set up accordingly. You got to uh, schedule a photographer to come through um, mm -hmm. and then you got to come up with the owner's manual. You got to get accustomed with the property. Uh, so if any of the guests have any questions, you know how to answer them. And then, you know, you 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 took it a step further and we still do this today with all of our listings. But if there is something that's a little bit complex um, that we feel like maybe a guest might have a lot of questions about, for example, how do you turn on the jacuzzi or something like mm -hmm. that? You will actually uh, film a short how to video, 45 seconds, and then put a QR code right by the jacuzzi and the guest can actually just scan it. And then a short little video pops up of how to operate it. And I always thought that was like pretty unique. It's pretty cool because that's something that we started doing um, at our, our property originally. I mean, mm -hmm. if you walk into the house, um, you know, there are aspects of it that still look like a house. Of course, there's, you know, a comfy couch and a bed and things like that. But I have signs everywhere. Um, everything has a label on it. Um, even the label maker has a label on it. I've got a picture of my uh, beautiful little golden doodle, Lainey. Uh, oh. The day that I went around and was... We, we love Lainey here. Oh, she's amazing. Um, <laughs> And at the day that I was going around and labeling everything, um, I even put a label on her to showcase that she was a good dog. <laughs> that's too funny. But um, yeah, so I think that's really key. And it, it's helpful, too, because, you know, these guests are coming into sometimes a city that they've never been to before. Definitely, well, traditionally a house that they've never been to before. And so to come in and not have to sort of try and figure things out yourself just to yeah. have all that information accessible to you without you even having to ask it like that's key to a good guest experience in my opinion yeah absolutely it, that that part is key setting the right expectation is mm -hmm. key so uh you know one of my listings here in san diego for example uh aeroscape condo it's right under the flight path and so yeah there's like airplanes going right over the the uh listing so if you're in it like it's loud. And so if you have a listing like that, it's important to disclose that and set the correct expectations. So guests don't think they're, or they're not surprised when they walk <laughs> into the place and it's like super loud. Right. Um, but it's, you know, when you disclose those things up front, the reviews just come back five stars. And I, I think the really important thing to remember, I think a lot of hosts, especially new hosts get into the idea of, am I going to have enough guests or is there going to be enough interest that's generated? And so they try to make their listing as attractive as possible, even to the point of, you know, saying things or making things seem to appear a way that they really aren't. And I think, you know, there's a lot to be said for the uniqueness of your property and having a good property in a nice location, um, you know, that's really kept up to date and you should be able to speak well on those things. But I think there's always going to be a certain type of guest that fits your property, right? Mm -hmm. um, especially thinking about your aeroscape condo here in San Diego. Like we have guests that absolutely love it. We have people that um, even commented that they went and watched Top Gun and then they came back and they felt like they were in the movie because they could hear and see the airplanes coming overhead. And so I think the really important thing to remember is you don't have to sugarcoat things. There's always going to be somebody out there. Yes, you want to make it attractive and you want to you know, optimize it and make it as great as possible. But just be authentic and be true to yourself and to the listing because there are going to be people who appreciate it and love it for what it is. That's so good. Um, talk a little bit about some of the technology that we utilize in our short-term rental listings. 
Sure. So we do have a lot of technology that we utilize in the back end, um, just with our reservation management and um, you know our communication tools. But I think on the property itself, we do utilize ring security systems. Um, we love those as a part of our tech stack. We also have noise aware devices, which help to make sure that we're keeping the peace in our community and um, that our guests are also obliging by our house rules. A new piece of tech that we just installed in all of our properties, uh, single family homes as well as boutique hotels included, is StayFi. Um, these access points are really cool because they'll help us to collect the emails and other information from guests that are coming onto the property and staying with us so that we then can continue to stay connected with them even after their checkout. Yeah, I love that. Um, the Wi-Fi locks that we use, we use Yale and they're mm -hmm. hooked, hooked up with remote lock, I believe. That's correct. And so we have VAs in the Philippines that can reset those locks whenever. And if there's noise sensors that go off, these VAs are monitoring these as mm -hmm. well. Um, talk a little bit about the VAs and, and how we kind of utilize them. Our VAs are amazing. Um, they help us out in so many different ways, especially in the very beginning. You know, it was really amazing to have a couple of VAs on board to help out with the communication. But again, as the company's evolved and they've been trained up and taken on a new additional tasks and responsibilities, like it's really cool and amazing to see them continue to grow with us as a company as well. Um, our VAs do a wide variety of tasks for us, sometimes special, you know, one-off projects or tasks, depending on what's going on in the company or on a specific property. But they do everything from vendor communication um, to guest communication, scheduling, um, helping us out with any tech issues, anything like that. Um, they're always happy to assist. I know we even had a vendor earlier today. They love they love the VA so much. Um, and one of our VA's names is Marlon. A vendor earlier today called and he insisted to speak with Marlon. Um, and I, I don't blame him. I mean, Marlon is an amazing person to talk to. So <laughs> yeah. it's just amazing to see like they're starting to develop a lot of these relationships as well. I love our VAs too. Um, and just for the listeners know, like our VAs are, are in the Philippines um, and they they do a great job. Mm -hmm. I, I love Marlon as well. He um, He's an investor himself. Yep. He owns some real estate out there in the Philippines. We, we got to get him out here to San Diego one of these days. <laughs> that would be amazing. Um, both he and Bell, our other VA, are investors. They actually have properties right next to each other, which is really cool to see them kind of connecting and, and also collaborating outside of work. So I want to transition to when we brought on the first boutique hotel. Uh, we had been managing short-term rentals in uh, multiple markets across the country at the time. And um, this is when I was still working with Pack 3 Capital and Sean and Mike and the guys. And um, I had the idea of like, hey, let's go buy a boutique hotel. And so we got the first one under contract back in um, summer of last year up in Northern California beachfront. And um, we're like, hey, we can use our management company to manage this short-term rental the same way as we manage all the short-term rentals across the country. We'll do self-check-in, self-check-out model. We can bring the manager's unit online for additional revenue. And then we'll hit all the OTAs and the marketing platforms such as Airbnb, Verbo. We'll hit social media marketing uh, for additional revenue. And so talk a little bit about what it was like on the operations side, bring in on the first boutique hotel. Learning to become a successful real estate investor can take a lot of time and dedication, which some people just don't have. If you're one of these individuals, this doesn't mean you can't invest in real estate. My company, Summers Capital, is buying a bunch of boutique hotels right now, and you can invest with us in these deals without having to do any of the work. Our team sources the deals, we secure the lending, we take care of all the renovations, and we even handle all the day-to-day -day operations with our in-house management company, making it truly hands-off and passive for our investors. If you want to learn more to see if we can help you, go to Summers summerscapital.com slash invest to book a call with our team. Again, that's summerscapital.com slash invest. Now back to the show. Sure. It, it was really unique. Um, I think operationally, like physically operationally, a lot of the same systems and especially like all, um, all of our tech stack and everything like that, it was very plug and play, right? Like you put a smart lock into a door, a door's a door. It, it, it's going to work the same, right? Mm -hmm. I think um, the biggest change for us was probably on the communication side of things. It's very interesting when you have a property that has so many different units or so many different listings and you have all these different guests with different personalities and links of stay and reasons for being there, just bringing them all together in one single structure, essentially. Um, so I think that that was really interesting um, 
just to kind of experience that, which is a little bit different than a single family home where it's a little bit more straightforward. Absolutely. And I think the other notable difference is, you know, with all of our single family homes that we manage, we have cleaners that come in per clean when we need them and we just pay them per clean and they're not W-2 employees. But at this hotel, we have two full-time cleaners that are on payroll and we actually um, utilize, they're there full-time, right? 40 hours a week. And so what is that? I guess that's a little bit different, right? And um, what what have you seen? Do you like that model better than the per clean? What 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 do you what are the pros and cons there? Sure. So Andrea has been incredibly instrumental when it comes to coordinating and building that relationship with our housekeeping teams at the boutique hotels. Um, and I think that it's honestly it's helpful for them to be more on a payroll kind of W two setup because they're able to assist with a lot of those little tiny one off tasks that not being there in person, it's, um, you know, it's really nice to be able to have someone that can answer that call when the need arises. Um, on the flip side, more on the pricing model end, it does take a little bit more finesse um, that, as Lauren's experienced, trying mm-hmm. to dial in the pricing and making sure that that um, cost of having that cleaner there for that time as a W-2 employee is covered. So I think that there are like pros and cons to both sides of them. Um, but I think for it being a boutique hotel, it's nice to be able to have someone that's there on staff, not necessarily on site all the time, but um, has a little bit more of a tie to the property itself. Yeah. Um, and shout out to one of our cleaners, Hannah. She's mm-hmm. uh, she's amazing. Um, and just a cool, bubbly personality. Yeah. So we're lucky to have her on there. Um, but also another thing like to keep in mind as an investor, whenever you buy a boutique hotel, um, the staff is going to be very weary of if you're going to keep them on post-close or if you're going to let them go. Um, and so as an investor going to buy a hotel, you got to be aware of that. Um, and what we decided to do was, hey, let's keep these cleaners on because we're going into a brand new market. Um, and we're going to be implementing a new business plan. Um, and so let's keep on the cleaners because they know the property very well. And it allows us to kind of implement a new strategy to a new market, but still have some experience on our team by leveraging the cleaners that were existing. And so I think moving forward, I mean, I think any hotel that we buy, I would like to keep the cleaners on and Mm -hmm. give them an opportunity if they do great. Perfect. If not, we can always replace them. But I think it's important to have a little bit of experience going into a new market. And I think it also, and not to speak for all of them out there, but I think it excites them, especially mm-hmm. knowing that, you know, that this property or the hotel that we're speaking of in particular, like knowing that it was quite run down and maybe hadn't been cared for up to its full potential. Like, I think they had that loyalty to it and that that personal tie to it. And so for us to come in and really be able to physically refresh it and bring it to life, like there's a sense of pride in that. And so I think like by being able to keep them on and really helping them to understand that we see and appreciate their value, I think that that just helps them to be all the more loyal to us um, and to the company as well. Yeah, I agree with that. It's um, definitely a big play there. So talk a little bit about the efficiency. So obviously you're getting some economies of scale if you have a 10 room or 10 unit boutique hotel. Um, what advantages do you have on, on that aspect versus a bunch of short term rentals? Definitely. Um, so especially at a boutique hotel, you will have your little uh, room quirks here and there, but the property as a whole is kind of the same. And so as especially our VAs get to know, you know, some of the local loves in the area, whether it's recommendations or, you know, specific quirks about the area that we're located. Maybe it's a question about parking that tends to come up. Like a lot of the efficiency does come um, come into play during the communication stage. Um, so our VAs are really able to familiarize themselves a lot more with the property because it's, you know, the same property over 10 listings versus 10 different ones. Sure. I get a question. So, sure. <laughs> um, what is the biggest difference of like managing that hotel uh-huh. versus, um, Aberdeen, the luxury Scottsdale property? What, what's the biggest difference there in your estimation? Sure. Um, if I can ask for a little more specification in what regard? In terms of like workload. Sure. Yeah. I think... I think that's a really interesting question because I wouldn't necessarily compare them as apples to apples um, in a sense that Aberdeen, I feel like requires less work on the question side as far as like uh, the physical property characteristics on the front and amenities. End. 
Yes, but I think we offer a lot more concierge services for Aberdeen that are taken advantage of. And so we do put in a little bit of extra work and a little more time and, um, you know, energy into those concierge services. So I think it like it helps us to be able to pour our energy more into the guest experience. Um, but yeah, I think they're they're wildly different properties. <laughs> yeah. And do you feel like with the guests at the hotels, they just kind of more come and go and you never hear from them? Um, to a certain extent. I mm -hmm. mean, I think a personality is, is different with every guest that comes in. And so some people like to wake up and tell you an amazing rest that they had the night before and they love the bed. Other people, you know, they like to pay their dues and then uh, just check out and be on their way. I think it's interesting with a hotel because you do see a lot of more one night stays. People coming in maybe last minute if you have availability or they're just coming into town for a couple of nights. And so you don't really get a ton of time to build that bond with them, um, which is why first impressions are so important um, with those short term stay guests. But on operating, on the other hand, you know, you have people coming in, whether it's for they're bringing in their entire family for some kind of a reunion trip or something like that. Um, or there's, a, you know, a, a bachelorette getaway or, or anything of that nature. Like you, you're really there for people in more of these special occasion and high emotion events. Um, whereas with a hotel, it, it, it tends to be a little bit more stopping by or, or on the way through. Sure. And then we brought on, we managed another boutique hotel. Mm -hmm. Um, up there in uh, Oregon, yeah. um, and Josh and Tim, the uh, the owners, great guys. They um, Josh comes to our real estate meetup mm -hmm. here in San Diego. How did that one come to fruition? Uh, so it, that's an amazing story as well. Um, Josh had been coming to our meetups and had spoken with us at, at one of the meetups about this hotel that they were looking at purchasing. They love that community and that area in Oregon where the hotel was at. They'd come upon it, um, you know, got, got into contact with the owner and it all just blossomed from there. And so when they were trying to figure out what they were gonna do in terms of management, um, you know, it had come to realization that we might be a possibility to manage it for them. And so, um, you know, conversation after conversation, we just realized that it was the perfect fit for us and we were the perfect fit for them. And so really excited to be hosting that property and, and continue to do so for many more. Would you say that operating that hotel um, as well as the first hotel that we manage is a lot of similarities or would you say there's a lot of differences? I would say a lot of similarities. Um, I think that specifically for the first one we were talking about, it, there is a bit of a difference in the sense that we, after purchasing that property, we operated it for two months and then completely shut it down yep. and did renovations and then reopened um, just kind of cold turkey. Whereas with the one up in Oregon, we you know continued to manage those reservations that were incoming, the ones that had been on the books for the, for the following year. And so I think that there's a lot of similarities between how we operated in August before renovations and what we're doing with Bandon. And then it's a whole new experience once you're freshly opening the doors on, on a newly renovated hotel. So Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think whenever you um, buy a property, there's multiple strategies, you know. And so with the one that we had bought, um, it was the busy, middle of the busy season when we closed. And so we thought, okay, well, let's keep it open for a couple months. And then once we get through busy season, we'll shut it down do the full renovation and then relaunch. That way we're not eating into potential cash flow. Um, but yeah, that is an interesting take. Another thing that is important within this business is that I wanna like touch on is the pricing management and the listing optimization. So I think it's very, very important to always be dialing in your pricing strategies. Mm -hmm. um, and we use Price Labs, which is a pricing management tool, but it's not hands off by any mean, like any means you gotta be in there dialing it in yeah. and um, you know, inputting those assumptions in order for it to continue to work good for you. Um, but also I think it's very important is, and we found this out um, throughout our progression, is it's important to constantly be going through these listings and combing through them and asking yourself, how can we improve these listings? Can we get new photos? Can we remove certain photos? Can we, um, can we have a catchier title? Can we put in certain keywords? And we'll play with these things um, in order to optimize them. And that bodes to be a very, very big lever. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think those two things, especially like starting out with listing optimization, 
um, and really making those one-off tweaks and figuring out, okay, is this is this working? Is this mm. the change that needed to happen? Um, it's very exciting to see sort of the results that come from just a tiny change or, you know, inserting a, a different review in the description or highlighting a different amenity as one of the cover photos. Like, it's amazing just to see how those small tweaks like that, as long as they're strategic, can really bring about a lot of great success. So I oddly love, like, <laughs> <laughs> optimizing these listings like I'm usually like growing the business and that sort of thing but when you guys are like sitting there like optimizing these listings and like going through the photos I'm like oddly like really into it I was like dreaming about it the other week oh. <laughs> at night and I was like I woke up and I was like hey guys I can't wait to optimize some listings yeah. with you today well it, I mean it, that's great because you're good at it and so I think a really cool thing about us just having so many different perspectives and personalities here in the office is that when we do throw up a listing on the mm. big screen and we really start to you know dive into it and figure out what's working what's not working what needs to change because even if you have an amazing listing in the very beginning, if you don't touch that listing for a month, you don't touch it for, you know, two months, it, it's going to go stale. It, it needs a refresher, even if it's, you know, incredible text and great photos. Like you need to always be adjusting things um, because you'll always be keeping fresh in the algorithm. And so I think it's really cool for us to have all these different perspectives and personalities in the office, because I think when we do put that listing up there, like, you're you're seeing it from all these different viewpoints, much like all these different guests would see as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's also nice having Lauren on the team now because mm -hmm. uh, she's been um, really owning that function of, you know, optimizing these listings and dialing in the pricing strategy, um, which takes a big load off of our plates. Um, because at the end of the day, you have to do those things, especially with mm -hmm. what's going on right now. There's a lot of saturation in a lot of different markets around the country. And so the days of you just, you know, buying a, three bedroom track home and throwing in some Ikea furniture and listing it on Airbnb and thinking you're gonna kill it, you're gonna get crushed right now, especially in markets like Scottsdale or Joshua Tree. Mm -hmm. um, you have to have a property that's unique. You have to have a property that's designed to the T and then you have to be on top of the uh, listing optimization and the pricing strategy. And so we're seeing that with all these listings that were coming through, we're seeing the huge tick up in revenue right now, which I love. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention is you know, last fall, we had some of our client properties that were would have a good month and then they would have a bad month and it was a lot of volatility. And so we approached um, a handful of our clients that had some volatile um, revenue because it's always important to look at the, the year snapshot. But we approached them and said, hey, um, we know you guys, you know, uh, are, are basically in this property because you want the cash flow and we don't like the volatility. So if you guys want what we can offer you is a long-term lease agreement. We'll do a three-year lease agreement, essentially a master lease, and where we'll cover the repairs, we'll cover the utilities, we'll cover everything, we'll run the whole thing for you, and then we'll rent it for a set fixed amount, giving them fixed uh, monthly cash flow that they can depend on every single month, and then we pocket anything above and beyond. And so we offered it to five of our clients, and uh, so far four out of the five have accepted and so I thought that was kind of cool. And then, you know, it's, I thought it was a win-win because they get steady, consistent cash flow. But then if we dial in these listings, we could potentially make more as well. Definitely. And I think that's a really good point that you just touched on about wanting to make sure you're looking at your revenue and cash flow as, as a year snapshot, right? Because if mm -hmm. you're looking at just a monthly P&L, yes, you can see some trends that carry over month to month. But you know, especially in all these different seasons of markets, um, it's really important to be looking at the big picture and not just what's in front of you. Yeah, no, it's definitely true. And, and you know, some some markets have big sways mm -hmm. in like their seasons. So for Scottsdale, for example, the busy season is in the spring. The slow season is actually in the summer. Most markets are going to be busy in the summer, busiest in the summer, and then yeah. slowest in the winter. January, February, typically tends to be some of the slower months because people are coming off the holidays. They just spent a lot of money sure. They're They have like New Year's resolutions. So they're trying to get back <laughs> in the gym. They're trying to save yep. money. And so they're not out there traveling. But then again, you have mountain towns like mm -hmm. Mammoth and Big Bear and Tahoe where their busy season is January, February. Yep. So it just really depends. But I think all those things that you mentioned is important. Um, one other thing I wanted to uh, mention is the cost segregation study. Mm -hmm. Since you and Mark are real estate investors, you guys have your own short-term rental here in San Diego. Um, if you work a W-2 job, um, you're gonna pay a lot of income taxes. But if you own a short-term rental and you are the sole manager of the short-term rental 
and you get what's called a cost segregation study, you can actually use the depreciation of the property to not only offset the passive income from the property, but also your active stream of income, such as a W-2 job. Maybe talk a little bit about that, because I believe you guys did utilize that as well. We did. And I, I can't even tell you what a dream it was. I mean, it was like Christmas, the day that our CPA called and you know, walked us through the document and what the numbers meant and what it was going to be like. And I, um, you know, I, I got off the phone with him and then I had him send it to me in an email and then I called him back and I was like, are you kidding me? Like, is this, is this legit? A cost segregation study can get us these numbers. Um, and sure enough, I mean, it, it all worked out and I just couldn't believe what a great lever that was for us come tax season. As long as you make sure that you've got great documentation of all of your purchases, all the improvements to the property and, and everything that you make every step of the way, I mean, it, it's a no-brainer to do a cost segregation study. It's a powerful thing and it's crazy how many people don't even know that it's mm -hmm. possible and they're paying a lot of uh, income taxes every single year. We just did um, cost seg studies for a lot of our properties in the yeah. portfolio, even for some of our third-party owners, um, which is a powerful thing. You might spend 750 bucks, maybe a thousand bucks on a nice cost segregation study, but from that, depending on what type of property you buy, you could have potentially three to $400,000 in additional depreciation, which you can front load. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're paying a lot of taxes right now, I mean, that's, um, that's a powerful lever. It's definitely a, a very powerful investment. Um, and, and like you mentioned, like on the front end, maybe the, the cost of the, of the segregation study can seem like a bit much. Um, but when you think about it in the long run, I mean, it's, it's so incredible. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm also excited for uh, 2023. Mm -hmm. um, we recently decided that, you know, we're going to look to really scale the management portfolio this year and Excelsior stays and our direct booking side and all that sort of thing. So we have a referral program out there for any of the listeners interested. Um, if you refer us someone who owns a luxury short-term rental, um, doesn't need to be luxury, but something that can bring in a couple hundred thousand dollars in revenue a year. Um, it could be a really nice cabin up in the mountains, whatever, uh, or a boutique hotel that we end up managing. We will uh, cut you a check for a thousand dollars. So we're looking to scale it, and I'm excited to see what other properties we bring on because I think right now we have the infrastructure in place, mm -hmm. we have the team in place, and now we're ready to to scale this thing, which is going to give us more experience in terms of operating hotels and luxury rentals and just give us a little bit more clout in the space and it's going to help us acquire more as well. So looking forward to that. Definitely. I think it's really empowering just reflecting back on this past year and all of those, it, we went through a wide range of experiences and challenges and, and new growth and successes. And so I think just having really taken the time to reflect back on all of that and figure out what were our lessons, what did it teach us, um, you know, what are our systems and processes and why are they, why are they working so well? Um, I think that gets us really excited about the potential of, you know, continuing to grow and really scaling and implementing these just like we did across our portfolio again and again. Yeah, it's been a, uh... It's been a crazy journey so far, but uh, to me, the most exciting thing is this is just the beginning. Yeah. You know? Let's do it all again tomorrow. Let's do it all again tomorrow. <laughs> well, Jennifer, it's been a pleasure. Um, I've always admired you and, and, you know, again, so grateful to have you on the team as well as everyone else. So thank you for coming on the podcast. Listeners, thank you for tuning in. We'll see you in the next one. Peace.